and um, it's good to start fresh, isn't it? I, I know when Graham spoke a few weeks ago, it was we were, I suppose, looking at the new year really, and we're still going to do that a bit tonight. I know that we're a few kind of a few weeks in now, but there's still it's still January. It still feels like a very new year. Um, so we'll be pick, picking up on that. Um, now, what when kind of I was asked to kind of share tonight, the first thing that came to my mind was the Book of Ruth. Um, strangely, that sounds, you know, a bit similar to my name. So um, I, I've always kind of felt there's a little bit of a, I, I love the Book of Ruth. And and, um, and my dad always kind of says to me, really, when, when I was born, I was put in his arms as a newborn baby, so he really felt that God told him that my name would be Ruth. So I always just kind of feel like I love this book. I just love it. And obviously we've got our lovely, my lovely, lovely friend Ruth down there, who is a very still person at the moment. Um, but OK, so we're going to look at Ruth. And I think, I, I mean, most of you probably know the book of Ruth, really. But it is very much um, a story that that is a fresh start, that goes from a place of loss and, um, you know, great loss for her and Naomi. Um, but God had other plans. He had a total fresh start and a, a redeeming purpose for her and Israel. So I'm going to kind of summarise the story a bit. Most of you would obviously know it. I'm not going to read through it all because it's four chapters and we'd probably be here a bit longer than we need to be. Um, so I'm just going to summarise it. Now, obviously, I'm not, you know, I've kind of tried to really summarise all the points and be um, a little kind of concise, but to the point. And a little bit about kind of drawing out some of the points I really felt that God was kind of showing me through it anyway. So I'll start. OK, so Ruth was wrote in the time of Judges, which was described as quite a dark and bleak time um, for Israel. Really, there was famine. There was a lot of problems within the nation. Um, and it starts off the story with a family from Bethlehem in Judah. Um, now, forgive me if I don't always pronounce the names right. So I've got Elmelech, Naomi and their two sons. Mahalon and Kilion um, and what they do they're, they're living in Bethlehem and there's a severe famine so they find themselves moving they move to Moab which is you know kind of further away and there would have been um, probably some tensions between those two places um, but they move to Moab because of the, the severe famine that they're experiencing um, so while they're living in Moab um, the two sons marry Mo Moabite women um, which is Orpah and Ruth. Um, it says they lived there for around about kind of 10 years. And then unfortunately, the dad, Elmex, died, leaving Naomi a widow. And then tragically, the two other sons died, Mahal and Kilian, both tragically died. Um, really, that kind of leaving Naomi, Orpah and Ruth all as widows. So in this time, um, widows they would have been poverty stricken. They didn't have anything. They It talks about we're, um, women and widows at this time often being ignored. They're in quite a desperate situation for these, these three women. Um, and just uh, when reading it, that real kind of sense of, of loss, of sadness, like massive disappointment. I imagine that for these two women, they would have married, thinking I might have family security, you know, all the, the things that go with that. Um, and the same with Naomi, I've got two, you know, strapping young sons, married these women, expecting, you know, lovely grandchildren and, you know, a kind of provision in that sense and provision into her old age as well. But instead, um, they just find that all that's kind of taken away from them. So there's these three women, three women kind of left in this kind of state of poverty and just with nothing. Um, so Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem. She's got no relatives in Moab, so she decides... Um, you know, maybe there's still some alive in Israel in Bethlehem where she's from. And she'd heard that the Lord had provided back in Bethlehem in Israel. So she thought, OK, I'll go back there. Um, so Naomi was left with, with the two widows, so Orpah and Ruth, the daughter-in-laws. Um, and she urged them to go back, to, you know, go back to your families, go back to your mother and father. You'll be provided for. I can't do that for you. Um, so both daughters protest and say, no, I'm, I want to stay with you, Orpah, which is just like amazing loyalty. And I just sometimes think, I hope I'm a mother-in-law like that one day that my kind of daughter-in-laws or daughter-in-law, because I only have one son, um, would want to, um, you know, kind of want to be with me to that certain degree or kind of just to feel like there's that relationship there. Um, but anyway, so I'll just read from chapter one, chapter one, um, 11. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if 
even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Um, and again, there's just that real sense of, you know, I can't do anything about this. I can't make this right. You go back, kind of go back to go back to your parents. There might be some hope there for you. And just really feeling obviously saying that the Lord's hand has turned against me. Just really, you know, that's kind of sense of that really loss there. So Orpah left and returned home. But chap, um, verse 16, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And I, there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, he stopped urging her. So we can see here that there was that real kind of, I'm not going, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, I'm not leaving you. Um, and just real kind of that loyalty that Ruth had towards Naomi at this point. Um, and then obviously kind of Naomi realising, OK, she's coming. I can't get rid of her, she's coming with me. Um, and when I looked at this and what it would have meant for Ruth in this time, I think, you know, she would have been um, in that land of where she had family. She would have had relatives um, and she kind of gave that up. She kind of gave that up with kind of staying with those parents, having that element of security. Maybe she could have found another husband there. And, um, you know, just that aspect of, of kind of being somewhere she knew, you know, that was where she was from. But instead she said, OK, I'm going to come with you, Naomi. And I think that's just like huge. I think, Imagine kind of giving all that up and going off with this woman who couldn't necessarily provide or give you anything, you know, kind of going on a bit of like, well, I'm going, um, which is just like an amazing, amazing, you know, to give that up, really. So Naomi and Ruth um, returned to Bethlehem. And then it talks about Ruth going kind of straight into the fields to pick up leftover grain and glean. Now, I was kind of looking at what gleaning means, actually, because, you know, you think it's one of those things, you know, and you don't. Um, but it is it involved kind of collecting the grain that had been dropped. Um, and that was a real provision for the poor in, the, in, in Israel. And it was actually kind of put into the laws that it was almost like their benefit system. But, you know, you kind of drop that grain and it would actually provide for the poor in the land. So anyway, she kind of went out and they got back to it and she went out into those fields. Um, and this is a, a real key verse, which I love, and it's in chapter two, three. So she went out and she entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, and I'll come back to that in a minute, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elmelech, which would have been her father-in-law. And um, it says in the New King James Version, instead of as it turned out, she happened to. And I feel like this is like, like it like really hit me. It wasn't by any chance that she was in this field. There was probably loads of fields around, but this is the field she ended up in. Um, and it and just being like that divine right place, right time, even the timing, because actually when they got back to Bethlehem, it was like perfect timing because it happened to be the barley and wheat season as well. So she went back at a time where God, you know, from Larson's right, I'm heading, I'm going back, or I'm going back and Ruth's coming with me. And just to find yourself in a field that actually is relating to relatives and the family when there would have been other fields um, at the perfect time as well. Um, so I just love that kind of bit in the Bible where it says, as it turned out, you just think there's so much in that, in that little kind of phrase there that just says, wow, that's just God's like sovereign plan. We'll I'll come back to that again in a minute, but I just thought that was quite amazing. Um, so she kept working and it talked about her working quite hard. And as she worked hard, it said Boaz noticed Ruth and asked who she was. Um, and then Boaz spoke to her, said, you know, stay in my fields. I can offer you that protection and provision with food and water along with my other servants. Um, and but verse 10 is at this, she bowed down her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And I think, again, it just reconfirms that, you know, she was this, she was this foreigner in this field, just this poor widow, a foreigner, oh, you know, had nothing. And yet she was in the right field with the right relative at the right time with a harvest. And just the, even that kind of Boaz it would have noticed her um, that, oh, hang on, there's this random woman in my field. Who's that? Oh, OK, this is who she is. Um, and saying, you know, stay here, you'll be looked after. Again, just that amazing provision that just is just amazing. Um, so verse 11 says, Boaz replied, I've 
being told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Um, which again, I think it's just that, again, just that Boaz recognising who she was and that there was a, probably a bigger plan there, really. And just then, you know, Ruth wouldn't have known God. She wouldn't have known the God of Israel. She'd have only been introduced to that probably by her husband and the family. But she was from Moab. That isn't something she was absolutely kind of, who's this God you're talking about? Who's this Lord? Um, but Boaz, again, kind of just said, you've left, you've been kind of really noticed for your sacrifice. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So Boaz asked his workers to show her favour and to allow her to harvest what she needed and even more. So it wasn't even like she was just collecting just to kind of just about be the her and Naomi. It was like even more. So more than she'd even kind of could, could actually kind of harvest herself. Um, and it kind of the kind of story continues. And then it talks about Naomi saying, actually, I want to find you a home roof. Um, I want you to be provided for. Um, so she has an idea and she instructs her. Um, now, I always think this is quite an interesting instructions, and I, I kind of wonder what Ruth might have felt at the time because she talks about going to the threshing floor, um, and then kind of she talks about preparing yourself, go and put some nice clothes on, perfume, wash yourself, go to the threshing floor, um, and I'm like, I wonder what she would have thought all that was about. But she kind of trusted Naomi. She's like, okay, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go and do this. I don't really, she, I don't know if she would have, if she would have known the plan. I mean, it doesn't kind of tell us, but I wonder what she would have thought really. Um, however, she kind of she's obedient. She says, OK, I'll do this, Naomi. So she goes to that threshing floor um, and then Boaz is sleeping and she uncovers his feet and lays down. Um, and Boaz kind of wakes up and sees her there. Um, and she asks him if he would cover her with the edge of his garment. Um, and he, he agrees to. And that was like that, that real symbol of, of becoming her kinsman redeemer, which, again, I'll go into in a little bit in a minute. Um, so it's just the symbolic nature of that, really. And and, uh, and again, just that it would have, would have probably been really, really taking a bit of a chance there. I don't know quite what else could have happened in that situation, but maybe something else could have happened. I mean, instead they were eating and they were drinking. And so you just think, I don't know what kind of environment that particularly would have been, but may not have been somewhere particularly as a single woman to be. However, kind of trusting that actually Naomi's told me to do this or do that. And actually it really kind of shows Boaz's character there, doesn't it? That he kind of sees that and kind of, um, and actually he talks about him thanking her for the favour that she shows him. He's like, I'm an old man. You haven't chased after the other men or the rich men. You've, you've kind of chosen me in that sense. And I just think there's that real kind of honouring of each other at that point, which, um, which I just think is really interesting. Again, that God's hand was totally upon. Um, okay, so, that happens. And then at kind of the next morning, Boaz kind of gets up. Um, he realises there is actually a closer relative to the family, to Naomi, um, and actually kind of goes and kind of suggests, I think he goes to the edge of the town and suggests, you know, do you want this kind of land? Do you want to kind of be the kinsman redeemer for this family, for Ruth, for Naomi? Um, and he eventually declines and said, actually, because you would have to marry Ruth and this the other, um, the other relatives, like actually know it would affect my inheritance for the rest of my family. So he, he declines. But that means that Boaz can then kind of walk into that. So, again, there's a real honour there that he didn't kind of just jump into that. He's like, actually, I need to do it the proper way. I need to get permission. I need to do it. I need to kind of get have that inheritance kind of officially um, to go with. So, yeah, again, kind of really speaking of kind of Boaz's nature there as well. And then it, it's, um, it kind of goes, in chap sorry, chapter four, I think, 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman, the women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given birth. And um, then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman, the women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Um, and I just, 
I suppose get looking at the points now from this again, really. So I think just really um, coming back to it uh, and that aspect of Naomi, kind of that verse there where it says Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him, that real sense of what would the desire of our heart, you know, to probably have that family, have that inheritance, that security was just kind of fulfilled. And I love that kind of picture in my mind, really, of Naomi there with a the child in her arms. It's like totally this is this is it thank you god for that it's just amazing and and this and the child the child was part of that lineage that amazing inheritance um which is just awesome um so another a few points to add that i got from the kind of whole story really so one of the points was that real kind of aspect of the fresh start for naomi ruth as i've just said and that almost like total turnaround so there was a point in the story where it talks about Naomi um, wanting to be called Mara. So there was that real kind of pain, disappointment, that bitterness, and even complaining really from Naomi when she first went back to Bethlehem or before she went back, just saying, why have you done this, God? You know, I've lost everything. Um, those kind of hopes of, as said, grandchildren security just really being taken from her. Um, however, that end result was that provision and that grandson holding that grandson in her arms. Um, then there's kind of Ruth's expectations which were probably low I mean if you're um, a kind of a widower coming into again a place where you're you you don't have anybody other than your mother-in-law um, you know she's a foreigner again giving those things up and probably just like a real low expectations of what that could have been for her um, probably not expecting to find that favour from Boaz or even expecting to be in the right field at the right time. You know, she just went really kind of obediently and kind of out of that loyalty for Naomi, probably with just like not much care for herself in that sense, really, just about caring for Naomi. Um, and so that really struck me as well, despite all this being like it was totally God's planning and timing and purpose and everything. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me is just that actually Ruth sounded like she worked really hard in those fields to provide for Naomi and herself. Um, so even though God kind of gave that amazing provision and favour, there was, I think there was still a real element of that kind of hard work and even initiative. So just kind of going that extra mile, kind of working hard and that also being real noticed. So um, I just think that's kind of quite important to, to kind of really bear in mind when we're thinking about ourselves and fresh starts and what God's got involved that sometimes it can really involve that bit of graft which you know sometimes it's not always what I want to hear if I'm honest to be honest I just want it nice and easy and a nice kind of road where it's all clear and actually involving not necessarily a lot of hard work where actually I suppose it, it, throughout the Bible it does look at that but particularly in this story it kind of really was something that highlighted to me um but Ruth's character so we talked about her loyalty and her noble character was recognised, even if this wasn't her intention. So again, I think Ruth probably would have felt like she had low expectations, totally under the radar. She's a foreigner, um, kind of not really with anybody to particularly look after her. Um, and she still kind of served. She served Naomi and just that loyalty and that character. Um, it wasn't, and I imagine she wouldn't have done it to be noticed, but she was. And I think, again, I think when we're looking at serving God and stuff, is that about us looking, look at me, you know, I'm kind of intentionally doing that, look at my loyalty and amazing commitment to things, or am I just serving because actually that's just my character and who I am, and that's kind of obedience and what I, what's good to kind of for me to do, and kind of trusting that really, trusting kind of Naomi and, and the kind of bigger plan really. Um, but God knew her character, even if Ruth didn't even see it herself, God knew that character and he trusted her with that line of David. And so that's just kind of amazing, really. Um, OK, Ruth's obedience, I've mentioned that already. So understanding um, those kind of things that Naomi would have asked of her again, kind of just that that trust in a mother-in-law there really to say, actually, I'm not sure what these instructions would mean. I'm not sure about these intentions, but perhaps still doing it and just kind of being obedient to that to that as well which I think is just kind of stands out for me as well and really what that obedience means and that loyalty was that again the fulfillment of those prophecies which is just like amazing um so yeah and one of the last points I think I wanted to go was that idea of that kinsman redeemer now uh, kind of looking at this I've heard this for many years and I've been like yeah I kind of get it but I kind of don't 
But um, a kinsman redeemer, I'll, I'll read it out, was a relative who volunteered to take responsibility for the extended family. So when a husband died, the law was that the wife could marry the brother, but obviously there was no brother for Ruth to marry. So in that case, the nearest relative to the deceased husband could become the kinsman redeemer and marry the widow. Because um, inheritance in those days was only passed to the sons or the nearest relative. So again, kind of really that idea that Ruth was used to redeem Israel. That again, Ruth was a foreigner. She she was in a sense not entitled to anything. Um, and obviously, what the kinsman redeemer really kind of shows us is that is Jesus. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. We are like Ruth. We are those kind of foreigners coming in. We're not entitled to anything. We are just, we don't have anything that's any, you know, we don't have anything when we think about our salvation. You know, we just got, it's just us. Um, and that, you know, that Boaz stepped in for Ruth, just like Jesus stepped in for us. And we're suddenly given this amazing inheritance and favour, which we didn't deserve. You know, we, we're not entitled to. Um, and it's just kind of just, amazing really through that just that salvation that salvation that we receive through that really and that kind of promise and that that kind of amazing inheritance that we have because of that um so yeah but there's probably loads more I could talk about that but I'm gonna uh, that just kind of was obviously the key thing really but to sum up really it was just really looking at how Ruth invested in this she remained loyal she took chances she was obedient um, and that God used that as part of his sovereign and divine plan. And he really kind of used her characteristics and her and all of that just in part of the, the kind of bigger picture, really. Kind of just that demonstrating God's providence and sovereignty um, and the use of difficult situations and loss. So I was just thinking about fresh starts and even just the loss and the disappointment that we might be feeling at the moment or we might have felt. Um, even with just 2020, just think there's a sense of, of disappointment with perhaps things that might have been lost things that couldn't be celebrated um you know and and I must admit I might have been a bit like Naomi and complained a bit at times and maybe still have even this week about how rubbish 2020 was for example and um, and I think it's recognizing that 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 God is just kind of still in control isn't it that God can still use those situations of like difficulty and loss and just totally turn that round and give us that kind of fresh start. Um, it just might require some of our own investment and trust in him in that, really. Um, and then one of the verses that really came to mind was Proverbs 16, um, 9. So in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And I just love that. It's just that really kind of key thing that I might have those plans, but God does kind of establish them. And it, it's trusting God with those steps, isn't it? Trusting God with that bigger picture. So even 2020 not being great and 2021, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but he's got it. He's got it in his hands. He, there's a divine plan and purpose is there. And it's just knowing that it is a fresh start. Every day is a fresh start in the sense of what, how God can use us, really. So it's just keeping our minds in that place and meditating on that, really saying, you know what, God, I'm going to be put in that right place at the right time. And you've got it. Um, even if we don't see the bigger picture at the moment. So, OK. So those were the main points and I've just gone past eight o'clock, but I was trying to time it. Um, so what I think would be helpful to do now is to kind of obviously go into our groups. But something that, that came to my mind, um, it was on that, you know, we did the playlist last week. Um, our favourite songs. Um, and Dave Smith, you suggested Do It Again by Elevation. Um, and I was listening to that and I'm like, whoa. And even just listening to tonight, I was cooking tea and thinking about this and, it was like do it again I think as you go in groups I think it would be really helpful just to recall those times when God's answered those prayers when God has just you can you've seen God's hand in action in your life you're part of those plans um because I mean I picked up my bible the other day this is my favorite life application and you can see it's like full of all kinds of stuff there and I look for it and it's it's years of like I don't know, a few prophetic words, kids that, you know, pictures from kids have done and stuff from kids' church, I think I've got, you know, just all different kind of memories and things in there. I was like, oh, I just need to get rid of this. And I really felt like God saying, no, it's not about getting rid of that stuff. It's about embracing that. It's about, it's not necessarily thinking we can go back to the past. It's not about looking back, but it's kind of bringing some of that stuff with us. So even as we've got that fresh start, just thinking about those times when God has been faithful, answered those prayers, 
you know, when we've seen God's divine hand on our lives. Um, I mean, my example for this is I've recently finished a course and graduated, thank God. And um, I um, I wanted to do this course quite a few years ago and I've been pushing the doors uh, for, for years and it's always kind of not quite opened. Um, and about two years ago, it kind of nearly opened. I was kind of pushing the doors and the route to work, do this kind of next course in my career kind of partly opened and then kind of felt went flat in my face really. And I was just like, God, I don't get it. This is, I really feel like this is your plan for me. Um, and I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do this other job, which I kind of applied for, what wasn't really intending to get, but felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and you know what, it was the best thing because actually God put me on that course this year just gone. And it's been perfect, perfect timing in terms of I've had a job afterwards. I've had a really decent manager. Um, I'm in a much, much better place in this last year to do that study than I would have been the previous year or the year before that. Um, so there was a bigger picture, there was a bigger plan. I didn't see it at the time and I got a bit irritated by it. And, and even my kids being a bit older, that was quite helpful as well. Um, and even this last year, actually, 2020, it meant that I was quite a few issues and stresses about kids and home from school, how we're going to do all that. And we've all been at home all year. <laughs> so actually, even though it's been a bit annoying to be that, actually, it's been quite amazing as well. It's been that amazing opportunity. So just think about that as you go into your groups and maybe kind of share, really, if there's times where you can really recall and remember times where God has just really been like just opened up those doors in that amazing way because it's about sometimes bringing that forward and saying you know what God, there's a fresh start but I have so you know you've done so much already for me so I know you can do it again and you'll do more and you'll open up maybe different ways but it's remembering God's faithfulness in that really um just like he was in the story of Ruth so there we go hopefully that was um helpful <laughs> so yeah but I've, there's a few there's a few questions, a few pointers, perhaps that I've just kind of given to Graham to give out. But um, they're not necessarily questions you have to answer, or, you know, all of them. It's just to kind of stimulate a bit of conversation, really, and a bit of thought around that. Looking at your new starts, at fresh starts, any new routines, kind of asking God what those would be for you as well. Um, 